Okay, let's turn to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. And we're going to be reading verses 1 through 7. Now the tax collectors and the sinners were all gathered around to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. And he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. This story opens up with Jesus speaking to really two different, totally different groups of people. The, the Bible identifies the first group as tax collectors and sinners. And that first group is a bad group. They know they are. That's why they've come to Jesus, because they want to hear the word of the Lord. And uh, that tax collector and sinner concept is really important for us to catch, because in their, in their culture, the tax collectors were actually uh, hired out by the Roman government to uh, collect taxes from their own people. And they did that because it was safer. If you had Romans doing it, they would probably kill the guys, but they won't, wouldn't kill their own people, and so they hired out the 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 Israelis to do to, to, to the Jews to tax from their own people, and by doing so, they were empowered not only to tax them but also to take their salary, and many of them took full advantage of the opportunity that was there, having the Roman government behind them, and so they were pretty much despised people in that culture. They had been rejected by their people. They felt that they had betrayed them, and so when they looked at the tax collectors, they saw them as even worse than the sinners. And the sinners were people who had, uh, had, had transgressed God's law that was visibly uh, known to all the people in their community. And so this was a group of people that were considered not acceptable to God. But Jesus is talking to them. And there's another group of people also identified in the Bible as Pharisees and teachers of the law. And they are just as desperately in need as these other people. And even more so because they don't recognize that they have a great need in their lives, a spiritual de depravity that's there within their own hearts. And they are, uh, the Pharisees were considered the, uh, the, the, uh, the standard of what was, was, was considered godly at that point. If you were going to be a true Jew, a true believing Jew, these are the people you want to follow, whose example you want to go after. And of course, the teachers of the law were the lawyers of the, of the, of the word of God. They were the keepers of God's word. They were considered the experts of, in, in their day of, of that field. And so they came not to hear the word of the Lord because they thought they already had it down pat in their lives. They came to judge the situation. And they were a million miles away from God. And so Jesus looks at these two groups. And if I was looking at these two groups, I, was saying, I would say something like, okay, the, the tax collectors and sinners hang around, we'll talk. The rest of you guys just get lost. You're, you're a distraction. You're a problem. You're, your spirit is not welcomed in this place. But Jesus wants to minister to both groups. And so he proceeds to tell three stories, parables, we call them in the Bible. And a parable is a story taken from everyday life situation. And uh, in that story, it would be uh, culturally relevant to the people of that day. But interwoven within that story, in that parable, would be a central spiritual truth that Jesus was trying to get across that parable. So he begins to tell three parables, the story of the, of the lost sheep, which we'll look at this morning, the story of the lost uh, coin, and then the story of the lost son. And the central spiritual truth that Jesus is really trying to get across to both groups is the value of people to the heart of God. You see, the, the Pharisees and the teachers of law had the truth, but they didn't have it in the right context because the right context is the heart of God. If we try to present truth by itself, it's a very dangerous, a dangerous thing. But when it's shared in the right spirit, and by the way, in John, it says that Jesus came uh, with spirit, with truth and grace. 
And both of those must work together. Because if you just have one without the other, you can crucify people with the truth. And if you just have grace without truth, you have a lot of sloppiness, sloppy love going on. But together, it's a powerful commodity, and that's what Jesus brought to the table with these people that day. And so he is ministering to them, and he begins to share these parables into the, into the tax collectors and the sinners. He's saying, listen, folks, it doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter what, what you've done in your life. It doesn't matter what kind of religious experiences you've had, good or bad. This is how God thinks about you. And to the Pharisees and to the teachers of the law, people that should have known better, he's saying, guys, listen, you're missing it. Because what you've got to understand is the heart of the Father. You're asking me why I talk to these kind of people? This is why. The reason I seek and save that which is lost is because that's what the Father is doing. This is his heart. And the important thing is we need to see people not for what they do, but for who they are. Value isn't based on action. It's based on the fact that God created these people in his image. And you people should know that because you know the law. You know the word. They were created valuable. All of us were. And it can't be taken away by our actions or it can't be added to. We are valuable to the highest point just by the fact that we were born that way. Actions can be valuable or, or not valuable, but people always are. And so this is the point that Jesus is trying to get across. And in this first parable, there are three points that we want to look at quickly this morning that really illustrate, really demonstrate God's heart for people and the fact that we are valuable to him. And we pick up the first one in verse 4, where he says, Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? Uh, first word that I want us, or the first phrase I want us to pick up this morning is diligent search. Diligent search. You see, we, we search for things that are valuable. And the type of search that we make for something is determined by the value of what we're looking for. Isn't that true? I mean, if you're at a picnic and uh, you've got to, all of a sudden you drop a pickle off your plate, and you say, everybody stop. Help me find my pickle. What's going to happen? They're going to go back to their conversations. <laughs> you say, no, 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 this is really important. I picked out this. Just get another pickle. That's all you got to do. But if a young lady runs up and says, please help me. My boyfriend asked me to marry him last night, and he gave me an engagement ring, and I lost the ring. Well, man, everybody's on their knees now, <laughs> looking through the grass, trying to find that ring. See, search is determined by value, the type of search that we make. And in this story, he tells about a shepherd that leaves 99 perfectly healthy sheep to go after one lost sheep. What's the big deal with one? When I first read this story as a young believer, I thought, man, what's the big deal? If I had $101 bills and I lose one, I don't get too shook up. I've got 99 more. If you own a car dealership with 100 cars and somebody steals one of the cars off your lot, you're a little bit upset, but not too much. Why? Because you've got 99 other ones. What's the big deal about that one? I was at church one day. I, I'd been saved probably about two or three months, and I came from a broken home. My mom had been married and divorced three different times, so I was a little bit nervous about the concept of marriage and family. But I was watching the, the, the families in my church, and there was one particular family that I really appreciated. I watched the father. He had four kids. He was a great husband, good dad. And I thought, man, if when I get married someday and have kids, I want to be like him. So I, I kind of got up close to him and started asking questions. And I said, what's it like with four kids? How do you, how do you, how do you disperse your love? Do you give like 25% to each one makes up 100%? And he started laughing and said, no, Bob, it's not a matter of percentages. But it's a matter of quality, and it's a matter of uniqueness. And I thought, well, explain that to me. He says, well, listen, all four of my kids, we have a unique relationship. They're all different. I love them 100%. They love me back 100%. But the way they love me is really different from one from the other. And so it's very unique. And then he said something that really got my attention. He said, each one of my, my four kids hold a very special spot in my heart that only they can fulfill. The love of the other three can't replace the love of that one. And so that is what's important. And when he said that, it's like the lights went on. I thought, boy, that's God right there. Seven billion people on this planet. And everyone has a very special and unique spot in his heart that only they can fulfill, including you and I. Every time somebody is born, something wonderfully special happens in the heart of God. 
a wonderful connection takes place with that one individual. And he follows that child, every one of us, through conception, waiting for the moment that we're going to be born. And then he watches us our whole lives. He's well acquainted with every experience we've ever had. He knows every thought we've ever thought. He's felt every emotion that we've ever gone through. The Bible says that the hairs on our head are numbered. It's amazing how God does this with 7 billion people all at one time, but he does. He knows us that well. Why? Because of the value that we hold to his heart. That's why he's so acquainted, and that's why the diligent search is on. Because God is desperate for people to know him. Desperate to make that connection with us. And so that's what takes place. Second point uh, that we see clearly in this passage, we pick it up in, in verse 5 and 6, where it says this, and when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Second word that I want us to pick up, diligent search is the first one, but, com- but compassionate care. Compassionate care. See, we take care of things that are important to us, whether it's our car, whether it's our children, whether it's our house, our job. Things that are important to us, we take great care of. And the kind of care that we give it depends on the value that it is to us. And uh, so we see again this shepherd. He goes for days trying to find this lost sheep, finally finds it, picks it up, puts it on his shoulders, and with joy brings it home. Boy, I'd be a little, I'd be a little ticked off. I've been braving the weather, the elements, bandits, all kinds of trials and tribulations, lack of water, food, climbing over rocks. I'm tired. I'm sweaty. All of a sudden, I find this lamb. He's going, bah, take care of me. You dumb sheep. What are you doing? You know what I went through to get you? We don't see that response for the shepherd, though. And we don't see that response with God. And that's the point that he's trying to make here. I have a good friend that um, he works with uh, antique furniture. And he, he, he loves it. It's, it's a passion with his. He's a master at doing it. And one day he took me with him to go looking for furniture. And we went to this warehouse. And uh, we went into the warehouse and it had this, just this huge pile of furniture just piled up on top of each other. <laughs> broken down pieces. It just looked like nothing but firewood to me. But he goes digging through the, through the rubble, and all of a sudden, when I hear him getting excited, he pulls out this, piece of, this, this small coffee table, uh, about three foot by two kind of a thing, and he's all excited. And he says, how much do you want for this? And the guy says, ah, $30. And he, so, he says, so he gives him a 50 and says, keep the change. I'm going, you got to be kidding me. I wouldn't have given him $3 for the thing. Firewood, that's all it's worth. And as we're going back, he's, he's telling me the history of this, of this coffee table. He says, this is the family line it came from. This is what they did. This is the country. On and on and on, how old it was, the, the type of, you know, I'm not listening to any of it because I'm thinking, it's just a piece. He made a big mistake. It's just a piece of junk. So I'm not listening. He puts about $50 more into it, and I'm thinking, waste of time, waste of effort, waste of money. And then he shows it to me afterwards, and it's gorgeous. It's transformed. It's a brand new piece of Furniture, I'm thinking, wow, that is something else. Well, he turns around and he sells it for $700. And I'm thinking, man, I better pay attention the next time he talks about furniture. (laughs) You see, my friend's a master. He understood the value of this piece of furniture. Not only that, but he knew how to restore it back to its original purpose. And we have a master shepherd. His name is Jesus Christ. And when he gets a hold of our lives, he does so because he understands our value, first of all. That's why he makes the search. That's why he tracks us down. That's why he sends people into our lives. That's why he has people praying for us. That's why he gets us acquainted with, 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 with Christians. Think about your life, what it was like before you met the Lord. Think about the number of people that were invested in your life to bring you to where you are today. It's just amazing, isn't it, how God orchestrates all that? As I shared before, my, I grew up in a broken home. Uh, my mom was married and divorced three different times. And uh, I was angry. I was bitter. When I came to Christ, you know, my life was a mess. Insecure, self-image deficiencies. I didn't believe in myself. I was, I was terrified of becoming an adult. But that's where God met me. And in my church, he brought a lot of people into my life, men and women who just spoke and, and loved me, and God used them to, to minister his truth and grace. And after about six years, I looked back on my life, and I thought, man, God knew what he was getting into when he saved Bob McIsaac. It was a mess. But he still got a hold of me. It was like that coffee table. But you see, God knows our value. 
He knows how he designed us. And that's why it's important, church, that we look past people's actions, past their attitudes, past their words. Because even though many of those things are wrong, they're, they're bad, they need to be changed, the person themselves is valuable. Again, they were created that way. God, God created us that way. You can't add to it. You can't take away from it. It's hard to do that sometimes with people. But that's what Jesus was doing with these tax collectors and sinners, and that's what he was doing with the Pharisees and the teachers of the law as well. I mean, some people would have rejected the other ones. Some people would have rejected the Pharisees. But he meets them powerfully. Third thing we see takes place, third point is in verse 7, or part of 6. It says, rejoice with me. It gets everybody together. It says, rejoice with me. I found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Joy. Overwhelming joy. It's hard to understand the joy that's in heaven when this takes place, but that's what takes place. This, she this shepherd finds his sheep, brings them home, and says, everybody will rejoice with me. And they're going, what for? Is there what kind of celebration we have? Is it a birthday, anniversary? They said, no, I found my lost sheep. It's kind of like the guy with the pickle, you know. Finds his pickle and says, okay, everybody, I'm going to have a party. Come, come to my party. What's the party about? I found my lost pickle. Bob, you need to find a hospital. You know, that's what you really need to find. Uh, they wouldn't be excited about that, but we find the girls' engagement ring. Of course, everybody's rejoicing. All right, put that on your finger. Weld it there. You know, don't let it get lost again. It's too valuable, too important. Joy is expressed by the value of what's been found that was lost. And think about that. Think about something valuable that you've lost in the past and you found it, and boy, sometimes it's a relief. Car keys, maybe. Uh, money that was misplaced somehow. Maybe a relationship that was broken that got restored. Isn't that great when that happens? My first dad, that happened with my first dad. and Man, it was such a, such a joy that followed that. I didn't think it would ever happen. Joy. Overwhelming joy. That's what takes place in heaven. Every time. Does he love the 99? Is he happy about you and me this morning? Of course he is. He is overjoyed with us. Every time you step into his presence, you see that. But think about the incredible joy that God is experiencing this morning with this church worshiping, authentic worship, authentically loving him, loving each other. Boy, God's up there going, man, this is so wonderful. The Bible says that he, he, he rejoices over us with singing. Isn't that something? God makes up songs about us. I'm not sure what song he's made up about me. It's going to be interesting. We're going to sing worship songs to him in heaven someday. And I believe he's going to sing songs back to us. He's going to say, this one's for you. Let me sing it to you. This one's for you. Let me sing your song. He may have several. I don't know. God's so creative. But powerful. Powerful. God's heart. Why, does, why is there such reaction taking place in heaven? Because the angels, it says that in the Bible that the angels are always beholding the face of the Father. And their response is to his reaction to what takes place whenever somebody comes to Christ. The connection's made again. One that hadn't been, hadn't been re, uh, connected is now connected. And the, and the response in heaven is just overwhelming joy. Why? Because of the value of what's just taken place. Let me close with a story from my own life. I got saved, like I said, when I was 19, came to Christ, and people led me to the Lord. And the people that, that did said, listen, there's some things you need to start doing with your life now, Bob. And I said, okay, what are they? They said, this will help you grow. Uh, go to church. Make sure you attend church when it's there. I said, when the doors are open, I'll be there. They said, okay, you start reading your Bible. I, I said, I'm already doing that. I'm reading right now, reading the Gospel of John like you told me to. They said, you need to pray. I said, okay, I'll pray. Yeah, absolutely. They said, there's one other thing. You need to, you need to start witnessing. I thought, what's, what's, what's that? They said, well, that's sharing your faith with other people. I thought, Wow. I don't, I don't know if I can do that. How do, how do you do that? They said, well, at this time in your life, the most important thing you can do is just share your testimony. Tell other people about what Jesus Christ has done for you. I thought, wow, I think I can do that. I can't wait. I look, I'm looking forward to that. Well, about two or three days later, I think it was two days, might have been three, I'm in McDonald's at line, and as I'm waiting to get a, my, having a Big Mac attack, as I'm waiting to get my food, a good friend of mine from high school, Joe, was there, and 
Joseph says, hey, Bob, how you doing? Good, you know, talking back and forth. He says, let's, let's eat together. I said, great. So we got our, we got our meals and sat down, and Joseph, first thing that comes out of his mouth is, what's, what's been going on in your life? And I thought, okay. <laughs> Poor Joe didn't know what hit him. Man, I was so excited. I just started sharing with him, gave him both barrels. I mean, I'm passionate. I'm excited. I'm going 120 miles an hour, just talking on and on and on. Joe, you remember me from high school? Remember what my life is like? This is what's happening. This is what God's doing with me. Uh, this hasn't changed yet, but it's going to, and I'm going on and on like that. And after about 15 minutes, right in the middle of it all, Joe stops me and says, Bob, listen, I want what you have. How do I become a Christian? I want to become a Christian like you. How do I do it? And I thought, really? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> they told me to share my faith, but nobody told me how to close the deal. You know what I mean? <laughs> and I'm thinking, I don't know what to do. I said, Joe, I, I prayed. I asked God my life, uh, but I'm not sure what to do. And I said, wait a minute. I've, I've got this gospel track in my pocket. It's called Four Spiritual Laws. And we picked it out, and I said, let's, let's, let's go through this together. Point one, God loves you, has a wonderful plan for your life. Read through the scriptures. I said, what do you think? You like that? He said, yeah, I do. I said, me too. Next page. <laughs> uh, sin separates us from God. I said, what do you think? You believe that? Those scriptures? He says, yeah, I do. I'm, I'm, I'm there. Me too. Okay, next page. Got to the end of the track. There's a prayer to pray. And I said, do you want to pray the prayer? He says, yeah. So we prayed the prayer together. Joe looks at me. He says, am I a Christian now? I thought, I think so, but I'm not sure. What do you think? He says, well, I feel differently. I said, well, I think that's good, but I don't know. Let's go talk to my pastor. In church, that's always a good thing to do. When you don't know what to do, come talk to your pastor because they know everything. <laughs> God, uh, God's got them specially designed for that purpose, knowing everything. And so uh, we went and talked to my pastor, interrupted his day. He's listening to us as we're talking. He's laughing. He's going, this is great. This is really good. I'm thinking, okay, whatever I did, it's good. And uh, afterwards, he shares a few more things with us, prays with Joe. And Joe is wonderfully, wonderfully saved. Comes into a rich, authentic relationship with Jesus Christ. It wasn't because of Bob McIsaac's great knowledge of how to share his faith. And that's a key point for us, church. Because really all of us can minister. If we've met the Lord, we've got something to share. It may not be a whole lot at this point, or maybe a whole lot. But whatever we have, it's good. And God takes us where we are with our knowledge, with our experiences, with our understanding, and he makes the difference. And believe me, I've been in ministry 40 years now. He still has to make the difference. Because no matter how much we get to know, it's God that does the life giving. And so Joe walks out, and, and I looked at my pastor. I said, Pastor, what, what just happened? And he said, Bob, that was God using you. And I thought, really? Remember my story? I'm, I'm, I'm thinking I'm nothing. I don't have anything to offer anybody. And God Almighty, the creator of the universe, is using Bob McIsaac. Wow, you thought I'd think about an elevation. God just did it with me. I thought, will he do it again? Use me? He said, if you're open. I thought, man, 24-7, this stuff's great. And uh, he said, okay. He said, uh, and then I said, you know, there's one other thing. Right now, there was a joy in my heart that I can't, I can't explain. I mean, there was joy in my life a few days ago when I gave my life to Christ, but this is different. It's richer, it's fuller than anything I have ever experienced in my life. He said, Bob, when, when, you, when you gave your life to Christ, the Spirit of God came into your spirit. And the joy that you're now experiencing is his joy over what's just happened. I thought, really? I thought, man, what kind of God is this that invites us into a relationship with him, invites us to join him in ministry with him, and then he shares his joy with us as well. Incredible. I said, if that's the case, then God must be really happy when people come to Christ. And he said, you've got it. So church, that really is the bottom line of ministry and missions. Why do we give? Why do we go? Why do we pray? Why do we make the sacrifices? To fulfill the heart of God. And uh, we can never pay him back for what he's done for us. But what we can do is we can express our gratitude in incredible ways. And one of them is, is giving our lives away to the things that are precious to his heart. And the thing that is most precious to him is us, is this world. Let's open up our hearts and let God do that. Because there are moments in my life, even in Lithuania, right in the midst of, of missions work, that I get a little uh, hardened to the people around me. 
I forget what it's all about at times. I get so busy, I, 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 I lose perspective. And in those moments, I just have to come back into God's presence and say, Lord, would you reacquaint me with your heart once again? Reacquaint me with your passion for the people that, I, that you've called me to be here and work with. So let's let God do that. If you're here this morning and you've yet to give your life to Christ, this is the Father's heart for you. Again, it doesn't matter what your background is, what your experiences have been. God wants you to know that you are very precious to him, that you are valuable to him, and he is looking to express that into your life with life, if you'll let him. So God bless you this morning. Pastor. Praise the Lord. I could listen to you talk a little longer. I told you to be done about this time. <laughs> but man, praise the Lord. Aren't you thankful for God's word and what it means to us? The couple things that just I feel like are for us here at the Gateway Church and for some of you that are here that may be struggling, uh, you are important. Uh, just say that, I am important. Say that again, I am important. Do you believe that? Man, sometimes life can get us down and we can feel completely uh, just beat up. But you're important. God has his eye on you. He cares for you. He's restoring us. And boy, that thought about joy, that the angels behold the face of the Father, I've never heard it quite that way. But I'll tell you, and then the joy that you felt was really the, the joy of the Lord and uh, salvation and uh, sharing our faith. Uh, makes me want to go win someone to the Lord, <laughs> and uh, I hope it does you as well. This morning, I want to close by receiving an offering for this this awesome couple, uh, but also giving an opportunity for you to uh, respond. And maybe you're feeling down, and you're saying, "Hey, I need the joy of the Lord in my heart. I need God to to work in a special way." Uh, we want to give you that opportunity. And again, if, uh, like Bob was saying, if you don't know the Lord this morning, don't leave here without making that decision. And, uh, and we would love to pray with you and to ask God to just touch your heart uh, in a special way and save you, uh, save you from yourself. And uh, it's nothing that we can do. It's, it's Jesus through us. And, uh, and so we want to give you that opportunity. Um, but as you prepared, as you've been preparing to give, I want to encourage you to be generous. Uh, and uh, thank you for your faithfulness here at the church, but also in missions, and then also specifically for Bob and uh, Betty Sue, <laughs> and uh, that, that God would use you to bless them uh, in their mission. And so let's go ahead and bow our heads, close our eyes. We're going to pray. We're going to receive an offering, uh, and then and then we will, uh, it, then this place will just be o an open worship uh, or a time of prayer. And, uh, and if the Lord is leading you to pray, we will stick around and pray with you. If you've got to go, we understand. You can stop by the table out in the lobby and connect with uh, the McIsaacs. Um, that would be wonderful. Uh, but ushers, why don't you come at this point and let's pray. Lord, uh, we're so thankful for how you orchestrate our lives. Your care is incredible. And the joy that you give us is unspeakable. And, Lord, we, we don't deserve it, but, Lord, you give it liberally. And, Lord, we just are thankful this morning. God, I pray that you would challenge us, each of us, Lord, to, to give uh, this morning in a, uh, in a sacrificial way towards what the McIsaacs are doing in Lithuania. Lord, I pray that this campground will be complete in Jesus' name, debt-free, paid for, and uh, on their way, ministering, to those 60,000 uh, children that are abandoned. And, uh, Lord, I pray that you would just give them great favor. Lord, speak to our hearts and what we can do to be a part of that. And, Lord, we also pray this morning that you would uh, be exalted in our own lives. Lord, that we would understand uh, how important we are to you. And, Lord, help us to share that joy with others that we would be able to uh, reflect your glory 
and your excitement for the lost coming to know you. Lord, thank you for that. And Lord, we pray all these things in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen. God bless you as you give this morning. And uh, as the worship... uh, Amen. We'll give you a moment, and then we'll all stand here in just a moment for a final prayer of benediction. And if you want to pray, we will invite you to come. All right, let's stand this morning. If the Lord is just moving and stirring in your heart, these altars are open. We'll stick around uh, and pray as long as you would like. If you want to meet for the backpack meeting, uh, we'll meet in the back here in maybe five to ten minutes, and uh, uh, we'll we'll, uh, gather up together there. Uh, But otherwise, Lord, I pray that you'd go before us, behind us, and all around us. We pray this for your glory and for your honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Go in the grace of God, and if you want to pray, we'll be more than happy to pray with you this morning.